Well, thank you so much for the warm intro. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about how you can collaborate on APIs better, you know, using Postman and a bunch of other st stuff. But before I get into this, you know, I'd like to just mention a few things about the state of APIs in 2019. So I mean, you know, we are at an API conference and we can agree that APIs have exploded in uh, popularity. And uh, we at Postman have a bigger kind of assertion. We've had this hypothesis since we founded uh, the company, which is that you know, modern software is going to be built on APIs. And that means that you know, everything, uh, every application that you're building is either using an API or is an API. So uh, uh, every engineering team today is moving from you know, this code first mentality to being API first, and everything from microservices to public SaaS applications is affected because of this API first kind of movement. And we've seen that you know, pretty closely uh, since uh, Postman started back in, you know, actually it started in 2012 as a side project, and in 2014 we actually formed the company. And since then we have grown to more than seven million users across the globe. So you know, with a quick show of hands, you know, any Postman users here? Oh, almost the <laughs> full room. So <laughs> that's awesome to see, and thank you for coming here. Uh, so, you know, we've been pretty excited about, you know, taking Postman forward, and uh, uh, we recently announced uh, a big Series B round of 50 million to take Postman to the next level. So if you've had feature requests or bug reports, all of those things are going to get addressed and all the bugs are going to get fixed. <laughs> so, you know, as we talk to kind of more and more people about, you know, how you're building APIs and how you're using APIs, one common sentiment is you know, something we were very surprised by. You know, a lot of people just hate building and using APIs. And we were like, you know, why, is that, why is that happening? You know, like, there is so much growth of uh, you know, APIs in general, but still there is this sentiment that gets repeated every time you know, somebody encounters a new API or is in the process of building an API. So you know, we, we realized, and, uh, uh, and lots of engineering team, teams have been realizing, that APIs are not just technical things, they are products. And uh, they are not just any product, they are a special class of products. So, uh, you know, how we see it is, uh, you know, the, the, the way to kind of reason about APIs or the process is just looking at it from three different angles. You know, the first one that you would want to consider is that your APIs uh, have consumers. And, and like the consumers of other products, they have needs which go beyond just technical needs. You know, they want uh, you know, their use case to be uh, accomplished. They want their business use case to be realized. And once, as a consumer of an API, you decide to uh, incorporate an API in your application, you are effectively giving some power away to the vendor whose API you're using. And that means that when you're building an API, you need to create a big relationship uh, with that consumer, and you need to create trust with uh, all the consumers of your API. The second angle to look this, uh, from, at this from is, uh, you know, APIs are created by businesses, and they have certain business concerns. We saw in the previous talks by eBay and, you know, ADP, like how they see APIs. And, you know, along with all the value that APIs bring, there are also constraints that you want to kind of think about. Uh, that includes, you know, your business strategy, time to market, legal issues, monetary concerns. And if you don't factor it into the development cycle, building APIs is going to be uh, a little painful. <clears throat> and uh, this is something that is applicable to APIs, again, you know, uh, in contrast with things like desktop applications, is that APIs are always on. So imagine somebody, you know, who's using your product continuously. You know, these are machines using your API. And the challenge with that is that if an API breaks, sometimes it might just break silently. You would have no idea about it. And you need to have operators who are making this thing click all the time. So, uh, you know, when you, when you see this from all these three different angles, you see that, you know, building APIs requires close collaboration between consumers, producers, and operators. And if you don't realize that this collaboration is needed, there's a lot of pain that comes in building and using APIs. So, you know, at Postman, we started to kind of build towards this vision of a collaboration platform, but before we kind of stepped into it, we looked at, you know, how do people and societies generally collaborate? You know, so the first one, uh, the first category of collaboration systems we looked at was, of course, religion. And the best form of collaboration, you know, get uh, 
people really believing in an idea, uh, you know, and they work towards in large numbers towards those ideas if uh, they have uh, that conviction. And, uh, you know, the second category is, you know, government systems. So governments are responsible for creating laws, enacting laws, and enforcing laws, and a whole bunch of systems exist to kind of support, uh, you know, the easy functioning of, of you know, people who operate uh, inside a government system. Then you have tribes. You know, tribes have existed for a long time, and still, you know, humans collaborate uh, through the notion of shared interests or shared groups. And tribes have interesting mechanisms to collaborate together. They have stories, shared goals, and tribes can scale up, but you know, typically you, ex uh, you see tribes existing in kind of small groups. Uh, and a more recent invention, and, and those, these two are you know, more recent inventions generally, uh, the first one is you know, business and, businesses and corporations. So corporations typically have a shared mission, they have bylaws, they have governance controls, and they typically follow a top-down hierarchy for decision making through which you can get essentially work done. And lately we have seen engineering standards or scientific standards emerge which allow different bodies to interact with each other even if they don't report into the same organizational hierarchy you know, through standards that are set by standard bodies and then uh, engineers comply with those standards to make sure things work together. So you know, what can we learn from these collaboration systems? So I'm gonna talk about the principles that we drew out and probably you can look at it as well. Uh, we'll talk about tools that are applicable to API collaboration. Uh, we can, uh, you know, without just knowing which patterns to actually adopt from these systems, uh, things can be a mess sometimes. So we look at the patterns that you can follow, and we'll also look at the patterns that you can avoid. So most collaboration systems have a common language through which communication is done. Now you can have a set of languages, but typically everybody knows what you are talking about and what something means. If you have a shared set of meanings, then you need to store them in a repository of knowledge and that everybody can agree upon is the source of truth for what you're talking about. And all systems typically have that, you know, in your government systems, you have constitutions, uh, you know, with religion, you have Bibles and, uh, with tribes, you have a shared set of stories, but everybody agrees that that's the common source that everybody else is gonna dip into. Uh, collaboration systems have, uh, they adopt a common set of interoperable tools. If the tools don't work well with, e with each other, which is typically what you see in government bureaucracies, then work doesn't get done. Good systems have effective communication strategies. So, you know, if you are just talking and nobody's listening, then the system is not gonna work. So uh, different forms of communication uh, media are adopted by uh, you know, these systems. So that includes your press, your uh, newspapers, your uh, video communication channels, and all sorts of other ways in which people transfer information from one place to another. And uh, uh, systems need good governance. Without uh, having good governance uh, around, you, you have actually the uh, spread of misinformation and you know, things really don't work uh, as intended. So you need like a course correction feedback loop to make sure that the system can evolve towards a better state constantly. So, uh, so these are the general set of collaboration principles we see in, in well-functioning systems. When you look at that, we, we can now reason about what are the tools that are available for API collaboration. So, uh, so the first tool, and this is the tool that gets mentioned a lot, is API specifications. And almost every conference has a track on API specifications, and we feel that's just one component of the overall uh, system that you need to get better collaboration done. And you have a ton of API specifications today. These date from the latest uh, uh, open API standard, something going way back, you know, 20 years, to uh, you know, SOAP or other things. And uh, you, you can choose specifications for their, uh, uh, for their tooling support, for their technical uh, abilities, or the kind of APIs they can support. But the general principle for all specifications is pretty much the same, that you document your API and the future behavior of your API in one place, and your uh, code or your you know, SDK or your documentation is all gonna follow 
from that specification. Uh, Postman has its own specification, which kind of you know, operates at a service level. You might have used Postman collections. Uh, and we are interoperable with a whole bunch of other specifications like GraphQL and uh, OpenAPI, uh, and we have more on, on the horizon soon. So this is something that you know, it took me a long time to realize, even you know, as a founder of Postman, that API clients actually play a big role in API consumption for uh, the developers who use your API. So of course, listed you know, all the other clients out there, but uh, you know, what we see uh, these clients and Postman adding value in is the developer experience of you know, using uh, your API. And that plays a key role in making sure that developers know what exactly you know, the API returns, is it consistent with the other APIs that they have used, and slowly they have you know, kind of their uh, understanding of their API built up in API clients. You know, Postman supports uh, importing uh, of uh, specifications, so you can translate you know, uh, uh, hard-coded specifications into usable uh, client code, and then kind of start working on your API pretty easily. This is a trend that we see recently emerging uh, around API repositories. So everybody has their way of kind of building a source of truth for APIs, but now you see specialized tools emerging which let you store specifications, documentation, and other constructs as first-class citizens. So uh, we've seen Swagger Hub, Stoplight, Postman, all have the ability to treat APIs and uh, these specifications as something that you can work in and operate on, and not just something that is translated into documentation or code. Now, the advantage of API repositories is that they, they know how to deal with APIs. They can integrate with other systems that you're already using to work with your API, and they're not just uh, static code entries or uh, static documentation that is just very, very hard to update. Uh, we see mock servers emerging as a key part of collaboration in the beginning of the API development cycle. So uh, mock servers are fake APIs that you can create you know, without really uh, diving too deep into code. Uh, you know, just like everything else, you know, if you write uh, your mock servers in code, they're very, very hard to maintain. So the typical way in which we have seen mock servers work well is that they are lightweight, throwaway mock servers, which kind of mimic the behavior of the API, but really uh, let you get a sense of you know, how that is going to work. So they are more malleable in a way, and uh, uh, that allows you that flex flexibility in the beginning of the dev cycle to have your front-end developers kind of consume the API, your back-end developers really see how these systems kind of integrate well when they are incorporating them in the back-end. Uh, and really, you know, as you kind of work through a mock server, it gives you a lot of clarity in what your specification is going to be. You don't have to tie yourself to a specification up front to build a mock server. You can uh, iterate on this as your API design kind of evolves. We have always seen static documentation being used a lot, but we see this idea of executable documentation emerging uh, within uh, developers. What I mean by that is that your documentation is not just meant to be read. Your API calls in there are meant to be executed. And you know, that's kind of the difference between uh, you know, reading a reference manual for a programming language versus kind of doing a hello world or a code the piece that you can kind of incorporate. Uh, you see the, uh, a lot in uh, you know, these Jupyter notebooks that have been uh, very popular in the data science world. You see that idea kind of coming to API documentation as well. Uh, I think the try it buttons there in Swagger Docs are kind of a start. Uh, Postman does that, of course, uh, uh, you know, well within the client. But you know, what you try to build uh, with executable documentation is a great developer experience that people can execute and work with rather than just endlessly reading about you know, what they can do. And this could evolve into something that is something goes, that goes beyond you know, what the API calls that you have. With executable documentation, you can really get people to try out use cases that are going to be used in the real world, you know, use cases around how your API can integrate with you know, somebody else's API, and really kind of get them to the finish line uh, while they learn this API. And uh, you have CI systems that can act as a check for all of this API development activity. So uh, you know, we 
we have seen uh, companies use CI, uh, use CI systems kind of more consciously. It's uh, the, the ideal way we have seen uh, people use uh, you know, CI systems is through a concept of review gates that they introduce as part of the build pipeline. Now that's where your linters, your validators, you know, all sorts of checks that you want to enforce can go in and ensure that while your software goes from conceptualization to production, uh, it's in consistent shape. Now, it's up to you to see how uh, strict you want to be with your CI system. So you can be extremely strict and say that anything uh, you know, beyond this review gate that you know, fails, uh, like a linter is not gonna pass. And uh, you can be loose about it, and you know, depending on how, uh, how much freedom you want to give people uh, around uh, your API infrastructure. So we've seen kind of all spectrums, and th there is no right answer here, but it's just one more tool to kind of deploy in uh, your API collaboration kind of strategy uh, to, to get people to uh, operate in the same direction. And there are tons of tools out there. You know, almost all of them support plugins that you can incorporate. Uh, you know, Postman has support for almost all of them through our Newman open source uh, project. And you, know, you can take a Postman collection, plug it uh, into your build pipeline, and it'll work just like the way you know, it works in the Postman app. So uh, you know, those are the tools that you can adopt. But we have seen it to, it, it to be very helpful to have certain patterns to help you uh, incorporate these tools with the right mindset. So, uh, so this one uh, comes from the product development world, which you know, is known as jobs to be done. And this was something that was created by Clayton Christensen. Uh, you know, he has talks and kind of articles about it. But the idea behind jobs to be done is that instead of thinking about your API from the perspective of somebody using your API, you think about it from the perspective of the job that that API is supposed to uh, accomplish. And effectively, that's the job your uh, API product is hired to do. So it just is a little bit of a mental shift in thinking about your product, but helps you get to the root of what you're trying to solve instead of trying to define a generic persona like a back-end dev or a front-end dev uh, who is going to be using your API. So we, we have found that generally uh, very helpful in product development, and you can incorporate the same uh, system in, uh, in your API product development process. We have seen maturity models to be used with great effect for getting consistency both on the design side as well as on the operational side for a large number of APIs. So with a maturity model, what you can do is define certain criteria like quality, availability, resilience, performance, and measure each API with the same set of criteria. Now you can be uh, strict about it uh, uh, through automated systems, data logs that you can pipe in to measure these uh, uh, criteria in real time. But the key, uh, the, the key benefit you get is that all your developers and all your engineering teams agree to the same set of criteria. And uh, you know, then they can take steps to evolve their architecture or evolve their APIs to meet the requirements of the maturity model. You can put gates against it, uh, with your CI system, for example, you can say that if an API is not meeting a certain criteria, it's not going to pass to production, and it's going to remain in, uh, in a staging environment. There are lots of ways to kind of use the idea of a maturity model, but it really helps you get consistency across a wide variety of APIs. You've seen the idea of consumer-driven contracts to be very popular, and that kind of flips this notion of, uh, you know, specifications on its head a little bit. Instead of the producer of the API writing uh, specifications, this is your consumers who are giving you specifications. Now the interesting thing about APIs is that uh, any observable behavior of the API is gonna be consumed whether you like it or not. Whether it is documented, it doesn't matter because once people realize that an API exists, they're gonna use it. And once again, they become your customers, then you have to comply with that API. So to kind of ensure that you are consistent with what uh, parts of your API or the way in which people are using your API is uh, being met and kind of uh, uh, incorporated in your pipeline, you can use consumer-driven contracts. Now, lots of ways to do that. 
Postman collections is one way to implement consumer-driven contracts. There is PACT. You can also use Swagger the same way. But this is where the consumer writes a contract and gives it to you uh, on, on a, a collaboration platform. And then you can incorporate it as part of your documentation or your build system. Finally, you, know, you can uh, build a source of truth for your APIs. So this is where your whole engineering organization agrees that this is where the most up-to-date uh, API information is going to be available. You can start with just documentation or local developer portals, but it should really be a living source of truth. And that's where uh, if somebody was to pick up an API and use it in an API client, they would, uh, it should work. Most of the times when we have seen source of truths uh, to not work is when things get out of date. And, and things get out of date slowly. You know, they don't really uh, have like a timeline through which they become out of date. What happens is that one API is not up to date, then the second API is not up to date, and documentation is a little bit behind. And that's where developers who are working on the API stop tr trusting that uh, piece uh, and, and really want something uh, uh, more kind of ad hoc. And again, that's where they start kind of building their own documentation. So uh, a source of truth kind of gives you a lot of power in making sure that everybody knows and sees the same things. Okay, so those are the patterns that you should follow, the patterns that you should avoid. Uh, this is high on every engineering team's uh, list, you know, avoid waterfall development where there are no feedback loops set up between different parts of your development organization. So if you do just do design and then you give it to development and then, then you give it to QA, changing anything in between is going to be really, really hard. And also it might not be very good. If you, if you think you have designed uh, perfectly and that's going to go all the way to production and it's going to be used in uh, the ideal way, typically that fails because once you do get customer feedback, you have to run the same cycle again and you go through a lot of uh, uh, painful you know, uh, cycles just to kind of fix one problem. Avoid ivory tower architecture. So what I mean by that is if you have a bunch of architects really not getting any piece of consumer feedback, then they will build architectural styles that have uh, sometimes no business impact. That's where when people become very religious about certain technologies or certain ways of building things, uh, you, get up with, uh, you get architectures that are just very, very hard to work with. So if you do have a centralized uh, uh, platform team or an architectural team, you should make sure that you feed information back from consumers back into that team so they can really come up with something that uh, is, is in line with you know, what you want to accomplish as a business. Tribal knowledge is generally how most teams start. That's where there is very little documentation to go with, but uh, most members know some, in some ways in which how work gets done. So, Typically, you know, you would have people really going into meetings a lot. They would be talking a lot, and generally, that's how knowledge dissemination happens. And you know, these are generally uh, 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 stories that come out, like, okay, this is how we did it, you know, last year. Or this is how it's kind of done here. And typically, when you hear these uh, phrases, then you should know that you know, mo some documentation or some practice is kind of out of date, and that's the time when you kind of bring in more formal practices. In. Uh, the reverse of uh, tribal knowledge is you know, having superstars or rock stars in the team. So in this pattern, nobody knows what's happening except one person. And that's the person everybody goes to. And you know, of course, they feel great, but they are stressed, they burn out, and when that engineer quits, then you have a ton of problems. So uh, try to spot superstars or rock stars kind of in your team quickly, and make sure you have formalized documentation and formalized practices around building APIs. So, you know, collaborating on API development, you know, is hard, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, we really recommend that you understand, you know, why people collaborate. There are lots of systems to kind of look at uh, ideas from. Uh, use principles to figure out solutions. They might be unique to your company. They are not generally applicable. Uh, pick up the right patterns and pick up the right uh, tools and just avoid toxic patterns. That's how you can collaborate really well on APIs. That's all I had. Thank you so much for listening. We document all of these things on our publication called betterpractices.dev, which we recently started, and we go in more detail in each of these. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got time for a couple questions. Are there questions? <laughs>
Yay. There's a question down front. <laughs> so when you work in a, a big enough place, I feel like you see all those bad practices. <laughs> what is your advice for Ivory Tower? So the first thing I look at is, you know, whenever there are collaboration issues, especially kind of in that mode, is like, who is the one that is calling a meeting and how many meetings are you know, being had? Like, I think just starting with documenting you know, the flow of information from, uh, uh, from that source. What we have seen work well is you take some of that advice or that information that, that's being transmitted in those meetings and take it into more automated systems one by one. So, what you're doing is you're complying with what that team already wants, except in an automated way. And then you start giving some freedoms to your developers to experiment with. So it's, it's kind of there are bounds that you, you know, they are set in a way by that team, but you formalize them and slowly kind of expand on those you know, bounds. And that would be like you know, a loser check or like you know, just a different mode of experimentation that developers can do, and then create a feedback loop back into that team, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Abhinav, yeah. and um, we're out of time, so awesome. thank moving you so to much. our next speaker. <laughs>